Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Eric Bricker with A Healthcare Z, and I'm so excited for all of you to be here. Let me actually go to full screen mode here. I'm so excited to be able to speak with you today about three profiles in healthcare courage. Now, as always, let's do a quick audio and video check. So in the comments, both on LinkedIn and on YouTube, you can put in um, questions and comments. And so please let me know if you can see and hear me okay. And also over the course of the presentation, please put in your questions and comments and I will answer them. And if I don't answer them during the presentation, I will answer them in writing uh, afterwards. So let's get started. So first off, a little bit about myself. Many of you already know me, but for those of you who don't, I'm Eric Bricker, MD. I actually, before I went to medical school, was a hospital finance consultant, did projects at the University of Kansas and the Cleveland Clinic and various other places, um, did my uh, medical training at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and then internal medicine residency at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And I'm the co-founder and uh, chief medical officer of a company called Compass Professional Health Services. That was a healthcare uh, navigation firm that grew to over 2,000 employer clients. We supported 1.8 million people across America, and we sold that business in 2018. And um, I worked with so many employers and brokers and benefits consultants, uh, HR, CFO, CEOs, that I wanted to continue to educate them about how healthcare really worked. Um, and that's why I started the A Healthcare Z videos, both on LinkedIn and on YouTube, which many of you are subscribed to and watch. Thank you so much for doing that. And I'm fortunate enough to now be the medical director for Simple Pay Health, which is an alternative health plan. Now, on to our topic. Now, many of us, as we work to change healthcare, it is very common to get frustrated and discouraged. I get discouraged very frequently in my efforts to improve healthcare for patients. So let's look at three inspirational stories of change agents in healthcare. And um, they have all exhibited tremendous courage. So the first profile that I'm going to talk about today is Dr. Vivian Lee. Now look at all those letters after her name. She's obviously a genius. She's not only a doctor, but she's a PhD and she's an MBA as well. Let me give you the quick backstory on Dr. Vivian Lee. So she grew up in Norman, Oklahoma, which is where the University of Oklahoma is. It's just south of Oklahoma City. And um, then after college, she was a Rhodes Scholar, right? You have to be a genius to be a Rhodes Scholar. Then after uh, studying in Oxford, I think that's actually where she got her PhD was in Oxford over in England. And then uh, goes on to medical school and residency, becomes a radiologist, um, begins practicing as a radiologist at NYU in New York City and uh, does tons of research. I mean, she literally has hundreds of publications. She works her way up the ranks at uh, NYU, which is one of the top medical schools in the country. And she actually becomes their like chief scientific officer at NYU. So huge leadership position at an incredibly, incredibly prestigious medical school in America. Then <clears throat> she gets hired away because she's so talented to become the dean of the University of Utah School of Medicine and the CEO of the University of Utah healthcare system, medical uh, system, hospital. And so while she's there, she does something incredibly innovative. She says, do we know what anything costs us? <laughs> Everybody looks around. No, we don't know what it costs us to deliver care at all. So she said, we probably should look into that. So they actually developed a cost accounting system and process at the University of Utah so that by individual clinical service and category, they knew exactly how much it cost to deliver all of their healthcare services. They learned that one minute of ER time cost the hospital 82 cents to deliver. Conversely, one minute of time in the operating room for an orthopedic surgery cost $12 a minute. And I could go on and on, literally down to the minute they figured out how much things cost. And that's hugely important at a hospital because a hospital is a services business. So the largest input at a hospital is time. So being able to actually understand how much cost per minute it takes is hugely important. Now, um, they did this and by, guess what? You got to measure to improve. 
So by actually measuring the costs at the University of Utah, they were actually able to lower their costs. In fact, healthcare costs at now I'm not talking the, not just the internal cost, but just what like it cost when they were like in terms of their overall cost structure, it went down by 0.5% at the University of Utah, whereas at other academic medical centers in America to benchmark it, it went up by almost 3%. So that is actually a tremendous accomplishment. That is orders of magnitude better than its peer group. Why? Because they actually measured their costs so that they could do something about it. Now, this um, was hugely important to them because they actually were providing tons of care for their own employees. So their own employee health plan for the nurses and the techs and everybody who worked at the University of Utah um, was costing them a lot of money. And so they were actually able to lower their own employee health plan costs by, by measuring and subsequently lowering the health care costs that, um, themselves. So they had an idea. They're like, hey, why don't we create our own health insurance plan that we would then sell in Utah because we can actually charge premium and take on risk. And because we're so good at controlling costs, like we're going to make money off that deal. And so they actually start now, it wasn't all of their patient volume, but they actually started then selling a health plan in Utah. So you could buy University of Utah health insurance. Aha. Was that just a coincidence that the Intermountain Healthcare, their largest competition in the state of Utah, in Utah, it, that, you know, it's not that it's population wise, it's not that big. There's only like three or four million people in the state of Utah. So there's really only two major hospital systems in Utah. There's the University of Utah and there's Intermountain. And Intermountain had already started its own health insurance plan. You buy Intermountain health insurance in Utah. So the University of Utah did the same thing. And incidentally, healthcare costs in Utah are incredibly low. Shocking. So it just shows how important competition among hospitals is in reducing costs. Competition is hugely important. Now, I want to bring up another point here. Um, this effort of creating a cost accounting system and actually understanding that an, a minute of ER time costs the hospital 82 cents um, was incredibly innovative because the vast majority of hospitals in America do not do that. And they do not know that. So by the University of Utah doing this, it was a huge exception to the rule. It was such an exception that you, you can see here on the screen that Michael Porter, who's one of the most famous business, business school professors in the world, he's from the Harvard Business School, he gets on a plane and he flies to Utah because he hears about this. And he says, what is this that Vivian Lee is doing? And he is like, I'm shocked. You actually know what stuff costs you? This is incredibly innovative. He calls up the New York Times. The New York Times does this huge article about Dr. Vivian Lee and her cost accounting system. The government of Singapore reads this article and says, we got to get Vivian Lee over here to help us consult on, on our healthcare system. And oh, by the way, Singapore is known to have the probably the best healthcare system in the world. Uh -huh. It is not run by the government. It's actually a private healthcare system. Now, it has a lot of regulations. In, in many ways, it's actually kind of run like a like an electrical utility, um, but it's still private. And they've got private, you know, savings accounts for the uh, for the the uh, citizens of Singapore, et cetera. And so Singapore, one of the best of the best at running healthcare systems in the world, they hire Vivian Lee to help them out even more because she's so good. Vivian Lee does healthcare consulting for the Department of Defense. Right. Because the through TRICARE, I mean, there's like a million people in the U.S. military, like the U.S. military has to deliver gobs of health care for soldiers and their family members. And what does the U.S. military do? They want the best. And so they use Vivian Lee as a consultant for delivering health care within the Army, Navy, Air Force and Marines. Now, she gets asked to leave the University of Utah 
after about six years, and it's kind of controversial. It had to do with their Huntsman Cancer Center, and potentially there was some, you know, of course, the stuff involves money, right? There was some stuff that was potentially shady um, about money involving the Huntsman Cancer Center. So Vivian Lee dismisses, like, the head of the Huntsman Cancer Center, and, like, gobs of people in Utah don't like that. Um, they put a lot of pressure on the University of Utah, and um, Vivian Lee ends up leaving. Interestingly, the article that actually wrote about this um, from the big Utah newspaper, that article has been taken down. So um, just know that, and it's sort of like the, you know, it's sort of the word on the street was that she was kind of, you know, I, you know, one might argue that Vivian Lee was actually trying to do the right thing at the University of Utah, and she was kind of forced out. But I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of speculation. Okay, anyway, she ends up at Verily at, at Google, and um, just until very recently was there. But she has, I mean, she's on the board of Boston Children's. I mean, she's still hugely important. And she's written a fantastic book called The Long Fix, where if you're into, if you're a healthcare nerd like me, and you're into reading healthcare books, or it's a, it's a great audio book too, then I highly encourage you to um, read or listen to The Long Fix. All right, next up. Profile number two, Dr. Marty McCary. Now, Dr. Marty McCary, look, the bell background story on him. He's an Egyptian American. He was raised in northeastern Pennsylvania. He's the son of a uh, oncologist there. And uh, before he went to medical school, he actually worked as an ambulance driver. So he, I mean, Marty McCary has been on the front lines of medicine since like the very, since a very young age. Now, he wrote. Um, he's written multiple books, two of which are unaccountable in The Price We Pay. And many of you have read The Price We Pay. It's a very famous book. It's excellent. Um, his first book was actually Unaccountable. And in my opinion, I think Unaccountable is actually a better book. I think it's a fantastic book. So again, I think you can get it on audiobook or or you could just read it again. If you're a healthcare nerd like me, I highly encourage you to read it. It's fantastic. And in this book, he tells the story of when he, so of course he goes to Harvard for medical school. I think Vivian Lee went to Harvard for medical school. Apparently everybody's got to go to Harvard for medical school. So Vivian Lee and uh, Marty McCary go to Harvard for medical school. Anyway, while uh, Marty McCary is at Harvard Medical School, on one of his rotations, he's seeing a ovarian cancer patient with the attending physician. And she's, a, she's an elderly lady. And and she has, she's got bad ovarian cancer. Um, it has um, this very large tumor in her abdomen. And the woman actually does not appear to actually want the surgery. She doesn't appear to want aggressive treatment. And um, Dr. McCary then watches the, uh, the surgical oncologist essentially convince the patient through various, in Dr. McCary's opinion, frankly, frankly, manipulative tactics, convinces the woman to have surgery. The surgery does not go well, and she ends up dying soon after. In Dr. McCary's opinion, she probably died sooner from the surgery than she would have died from the ovarian cancer itself. Dr. McCary is so disgusted by this incident that he leaves medical school. People don't leave Harvard Medical School. I mean, that is a huge risk. That is incredibly um, swimming against stream and going against the grain. So just, just flabbergasted, just dumbfounded at what he saw as doctors not acting in the best interest of patients, in his opinion. And so he goes and he gets his uh, master's of public health, and he's like, okay, I'm going to you know, have – a highly patient, patient centric career. Okay. So fine. So he does his, you know, what says, Hey, I want to become a surgeon, goes to Georgetown for his surgery residency. During his surgery residency, you've got to cover various different services, right? So you do general surgery, you do plastic surgery, you do surgical oncology, you do vascular surgery, you do trauma surgery. So during his trauma surgery, he does, goes to, he does his rotation at DC general, which is kind of the big public hospital in Washington, DC, right? It's kind of akin to uh, Cook County in Chicago or, um, or Parkland here in Dallas, um, or Grady in Atlanta. And so there's a, you know, unfortunately there's a bad uh, trauma incident. And literally um, like close to 20 patients from this trauma uh, incident come in and he is, and it's overnight, and he is the only uh, trauma you know, person on call in the hospital. Um, and he is a junior resident. And you obviously when you're a resident, you go up the chain of command. And so he was like, 
and the ER staff were struggling to take care of, you know, upwards of 20 trauma patients that needed to go to the OR. And met, not all of them did, but a lot of them did. And Dr. McCurry calls up his senior resident who's at home because he's going up the chain of command um, and says, hey, listen, I got all these people. I, I, I can't do it. It's too many people for me. And the senior resident says to him, um, Dr. McCurry, sounds like you need to get more organized and hangs up the phone on. So that was it. Dr. McCurry was on his own. And, you know, he did the best he could. But in Dr. McCurry's opinion, again, two people died that night that, in his opinion, if he had had the extra help, those people would not have died, in his opinion. So, again, completely disgusted by his fellow physicians. And so goes on to become a uh, – does a fellowship – uh, at Johns Hopkins, and he is a surgeon today at Johns Hopkins. We were actually there at the same time. Hopkins is a huge place, so I didn't know him. We never ran into each other uh, there. I actually have subsequently met him, and I've had lunch with uh, Dr. McCary, fantastic guy, as you can imagine. But he really has become a defender of patients, and not just a defender of patients in terms of clinical care, but a defender of patients financially. And he was just, again, disgusted when he saw hospitals suing patients for unpaid balances. And so he would actually act as an expert witness and defend these patients. And there was a very famous case of the University of Virginia Hospital Medical Center going after patients. And Dr. McCary's whole deal is, is like, look, these bills and these charges, like a lot of them are like in error. They're not correct. They're hugely inflated. And so here you are suing patients and the patient like wouldn't be able to hire a lawyer. They wouldn't even know they were being sued. They wouldn't show up to court. And then in certain states, then if you don't show up to court or you lose, then the hospital can actually garnish your wages. So in places like Virginia and Tennessee, hospitals were garnishing the wages of typically very poor people who were not paying their medical bills. And so Dr. McCary defends them, um, shows up in court. A lot of times the, the judge sides in favor of the patient and there starts to be news articles and uh, papers uh, write about this. And so the University of Virginia changed their, changes their practice. I think major executives at the University of Virginia were fired or left. Um, same thing happens in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so um, Dr. Martin McCary, not hop popular with, um, with hospitals. Dr. Martin McCary, listen, I still know a lot of attending physicians at Hopkins. Like Dr. McCary is not popular amongst his fellow doctors at Hopkins. Like, sure, there's there's some doctors and there's faculty at Hopkins that really like him, but there's a lot of doctors at Hopkins that are like, why are you dealing with this insurance money business? Why won't you just be a doctor and treat patients? And Dr. McCary's like, this is a big deal. <laughs> like, this, this is negatively affecting our patients and our patients are being taken advantage of. And we as physicians, like, we should do something about it. And they, blah, blah, blah. so like, Dr. McCary, like Dr. Vivian Lee, has a lot of courage to go against the grain and to do something that is unpopular for the sake of patients. Third and final is Wendell Potter. And again, I would say that, look, if you work in healthcare, like it's kind of like following the NFL. Like there's certain players you have to know. Like you got to know Tom Brady, right? And so you got to know Vivian Lee. You got to know Marty McCary and you got to know Wendell Potter. Like you got to know these people. Okay. So he's not a doctor, but he was a high ranking PR executive. In fact, I think he was the highest ranking PR executive at um, two of the largest health insurance companies in America, Humana and Cigna. And then he subsequently left um, the health insurance world in 2007, again, in disgust because of what he had seen. Uh, and what, frankly, what personally he had done, he had a um, sort of a bright light experience that I'm going to describe in a minute. Now, what, first of all, what is public relations? There was the, the sort of a founder of public relations in America was this guy named Edward Bernays, who, believe it or not, was actually the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Edward Bernays is actually from Austria originally. And um, Edward Bernays' mom was the sister of Sigmund Freud. And so he knew a lot about psychology. And he's like, oh, you know, you can really use psychology to change people's the way that people think. And so he didn't call it PR, but it's essentially like 
propaganda. Like, so the entire like PR industry and the entire propaganda industry is around changing the way people think. Now, I, I'm not gonna gonna get into um, the pros and the cons of PR or whatever, but the point is, is that it's no surprise that health insurance companies have executives and budgets and specific strategies designed to change the way that people think. Okay, what's an example of that? So according to Dr. Wendell Potter, during the entire debate of the Affordable Care Act in 2009 and 2010, there were some politicians that would use the term death panel to describe what would happen um, if the ACA was put in place. Death panel being like, okay, there would be a people in the government somewhere that would decide who would live and who would die because of this massive government takeover of healthcare that was going to be the ACA. And I'm like, okay, right, that seems a little alarmist and extreme. I'm sure many of you remember that as well. But that entire term, death panel, and all the talking points around death panel was not some random idea that these Congress people came up it was a intentional PR campaign and strategy of the health insurance industry. And they have lots of lobbyists. And so they had death panel talking points that they would then give to the politicians. And they would be like, okay, you know, if you're going on, you know, this week or face the nation or any of these Sunday morning shows, then you need to go and use these de this death panel verbiage. Right. So the health insurance industry created the entire uh, death panel talking points that politicians use during the affordable care. Act. Now, the um, the uh, the come to light um, or the 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 bright light um, experience that Wendell Potter had that caused him to completely change his mindset and um, and leave the health insurance industry um, happened in Eastern Tennessee around the Knoxville area because Eastern Tennessee is where Wendell Potter is originally from. So he was back home visiting his family, and there was a free clinic. Um, free health care offered by some organization. It might have been in the state of Tennessee. I don't know. But it was at the sort of the East Tennessee fairgrounds. And there were so many people who needed health care who couldn't afford it that they drove from hundreds of miles away. And the line was so long that people had to sleep in their cars. And there were so many people that they used the animal stalls and like the herding pens and gates at the fairgrounds to herd all the people. So people were literally waiting in animal stalls for free health care and sleeping in their cars. And he says, what kind of country do we live in where health care is so expensive that people can't afford it, that they have to sleep in their cars and wait in animal stalls to get it? And I, Wendell Potter, Wendell Potter, am part of the problem. So he says, forget it. I've had enough and has become a huge opponent against the health insurance industry and its practices. And he uh, testified before Congress about a practice known as lemon dropping, where health insurance companies would drop uh, sick members. Um, now, this was before the ACA was passed, back when uh, health insurance companies could actually, you know, um, you know, you know, you know, underwrite their individual health insurance policies, et cetera, et cetera. And they would, they were like actively just looking at the line item of individuals that they could drop off their health insurance plans. And they would, you know, come up with some sort of excuse to drop them. Um, and to this day, Wendell Potter speaks at tons of events and is highly vocal in regards to the inner workings of the health insurance industry. And of course, Wendell Potter, hugely unpopular with the health insurance industry. And so it took a lot of, I mean, look, 2007, that's going on like 16 years ago that this, that he left, that, that he's been doing this and that he has been uh, trumpeting his, um, his adversarial uh, point of view versus the health insurance industry. And again, it takes a lot of courage to do that. So What's my point? This is kind of hard to see. So I'm going to uh, blow this up into uh, full screen here so that my point here is that these three people acted with tremendous courage to address the misalignment within the healthcare system, the misalignment with, of incentives within the healthcare system that is hurting patients today. Vivian Lee, 
and Marty McCary and Wendell Potter did something about it. And my point is, is that the misaligned incentives within healthcare are themselves a public health threat akin to smoking. And that's what this graph is here. This graph is the number of the average number, or not the average number, this is the number of cigarettes per American per day that were consumed. So it maxed out after World War II in about 1950, 1960, where it was, it was 10 cigarettes for every man and woman in America. Now, and then look at this. And then this is like all the different things that happened. So it peaked and then look at that. It went way, 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 way down. Now, note that it took, that it peaked in like 1960. Now this only goes to 210, but it's continued to go down to today. So from 1960 to 2010, that's 50 years. So in other words, this was a multi-decade public health initiative to reduce the amount of smoking in America. And guess what? It's worked. And my point is, is that reducing the misalignment in America will also follow the same trajectory as smoking in America. Like it's not going to change overnight. The courage of these three people should not be expected to quote unquote fix healthcare overnight. Just like we haven't fixed smoking in America. We never will fix smoking in America. It is a long, slow progression over time of improvement. So we've got another line on here. What is that line? That is the number of deaths from lung cancer. Guess what? The number of deaths from lung cancer has gone down as smoking has gone down. It's worked. Why did, why was smoking, like smoking wasn't even invented. You can see here until 1910, like the cigarette didn't even exist. The cigarette was invented and it was a mechanism for profits by corporations, by tobacco companies, just like the misalignment in healthcare is a source of profit for corporations. This is no different. And so like, do corporations in America absolutely intentionally try to make money um, by exploiting people? Absolutely. Like healthcare is my turf. My Like, does it happen in other parts of America? Absolutely. Right. But like healthcare is my turf. And so and healthcare is all of your turf as well. And so we need to address the misaligned incentives in healthcare the way that we address smoking, in that it is a multi decade prolonged effort to one, it, it's to cut healthcare costs, right? The misaligned uh, incentives in healthcare dramatically makes the cost too high. I don't care about the money. Here's why it's important. It's because it impairs access. It's because of those people in East Tennessee who had to sleep in their cars and um, be in animal stalls. Okay. That's why healthcare costs is a problem because it impairs access. Okay. The fee for service. I would, I, we shouldn't even call it fee for service. It is, it is payment without accountability right? Because in fee-for-service, you get paid no matter what. So unaccountable payment, it doesn't just hurt quality. Unaccountable payment is unsafe for patients. Because if you get paid no matter what, if you get paid when there are errors, guess what? There's going to be a lot of errors. If you don't pay when there's errors, guess what will happen to those errors? They will go down. So the point is, is that unaccountable pay and continuing to pay for errors, like, is unsafe. So, we, so that needs to change. And it needs a multi-prong approach. It Just like with smoking, right? Smoking was done, was done with policy. It was done with laws. It was done through the court system. It was done with lawsuits. It was done through the media, not only with removing smoking advertisements, but then having smoking advertising, anti-smoking advertising campaigns. And it was done through social norms. It was done through things like, well, I don't really, and, and other laws too, like the whole concept Think about how much lung cancer was caused by secondhand smoke. And now think about how many bartenders and waiters and waitresses got lung cancer because they had to work in an incredibly unsafe environment from all the secondhand smoke in those bars and restaurants, right? So the cultural norms now, it's like, it's like a, you know, I mean, all of us, I mean, I, I was, when I was growing up, you could smoke on a plane, right? If anyone smoked a cigarette on a plane, now you would be, again, like, it's against the law, but you would be shocked. Even if it wasn't against the law, you would be shocked. If somebody smoked a cigarette on a plane because it's completely against the social norms. So all of these things will happen with the misaligned incentives in healthcare. And so 
what are some take-home points that we can do to actually um, act? Okay, one, we need to understand that healthcare change is unpopular. So there are many doctors and people uh, who, who do not like what I have to say, and that is a sign of progress, right? That is, that's important. Like I have no interest in everybody liking what I have to say. If everybody liked what I have to say, then I wouldn't be accomplishing what I'm trying to accomplish. Likewise with you, what you do is not going to be popular. We should expect a lack of popularity too. It's prolonged. Like this is, this takes decades, decades. Okay. So like the fact that healthcare isn't going to change in my, like healthcare isn't going to be fixed in my lifetime or your lifetime. Like that's okay. Like I'm totally okay with it. It's like smoking. We can absolutely move the ball down the field and improve things. And as you can tell, I'm excited to do that. Okay, next, there are specific things that you can do to share what you know, because of course, everybody's like, well, if I speak up, I'm going to lose my job, okay? You can share what you know with people that are out there who can share information that would love to know what you know. ProPublica does a fantastic job of reporting on healthcare. They had a recent article about, uh, uh, you know, bad things that United Healthcare was doing. And the reporters there were Maya Miller and David Armstrong. I guarantee you that if you email them, that they would love to talk to you on the phone and you don't, you don't have to put it in writing, but you can tell them stuff that you see. So like my call to action is email maya.miller at propublica.org or david.armstrong at propublica. And listen, just be like, hey, I just want to give me a phone. I just want to give you the heads up. And I guarantee you, they would love to hear about what you're seeing and hearing. So, with that, I will end today's presentation. Um, I will answer your questions uh, in writing in the comments. Thank you for putting them in. If you would like to connect with me on LinkedIn, I would love for you to do that. If you would like to join my email list, my video email list, goes out Monday through Friday. Um, have thousands of people on this email list. Just email me at ericb at ahealthcarez.com and I will, um, I'll add you to the email list. Um, and with that, I appreciate everybody's uh, effort to improve healthcare. And I hope you have a fantastic day and a great weekend. Bye now.